I want to welcome you to the, the, the feature event of our Martin Luther King Week observation. Uh, observation. Our speaker tonight is somebody that if you're a, a student of the movement, uh, you know about. But I'll tell you something else. If you were a teacher or a teacher educator, you've seen this guy's work and you didn't know it. He was at the time that uh, the, the Jane Elliott Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes documentary uh, uh, that, that was called Class Divided that all educators have seen. He was the PBS correspondent who did that work. So in the equity retreat, when you've done Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes, he's the guy that did this uh, work with Jane Elliott uh, about 20 years ago, which is illustrative of a lot of people who were in the the, the movement in the, in, the, in the 1960s, that the, the quest for human betterment and social justice was a single chapter in a long life richly invested in serving other people for the, good of, for the common good and, and for the good of humankind. And so it's my high honor and distinct uh, privilege to introduce to you Charles E. Charlie Cobb. Uh, Charlie was born in Washington, D.C. Uh, came of age in Springfield, Massachusetts, but returned to Washington, D.C. and attended, uh, we have an, another alum of that institution that just walked in, attended uh, Howard University, where his mother was the chair of the Department of Romance Languages. And as a person, a young person coming of age in the early 1960s, Charlie was caught up in the events that affected all people, but especially people of color in the United States, that that we remember retrospectively as the Civil Rights Movement. And he was first arrested in Annapolis, Maryland. It would not be the last time. And uh, the, the bulk of his uh, formal civil rights work was as a, a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, working in the meanest place that ever existed in human history, the state of Mississippi uh, in the 1960s. And he would work for for SNCC until 1967. And then he entered into a long career as a journalist, first with National Public Radio, and then with the public broadcasting uh, uh, system, and then for 13 years as a staff writer of National, uh, for National Geographic, where he wrote lots of really interesting stories. And if you're a reader of National Geographic, you've seen his work. And then he uh, began to, to write, essentially uh, somewhat full-time, write and teach full-time. Uh, his first book uh, w was called Radical Equations, which is a, the study of the career of Bob Moses, Bob who was here two years ago, the, the movement from civil rights in Mississippi, rights to vote to achieve constitutional personhood, to the current civil right, uh, the right to an appropriate education, especially in mathematics. And then Charlie has continued to write, and we're selling these outside. Uh, this is Charlie's uh, latest book, This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, which is a great read. And for those of you that think you know something about the movement, the, the title is, is uh, a little bit of uh, maybe mind-bending mind for you. I don't wish to embarrass our speaker, but I will tell you what his peers said about him at the time. <laughs> And they say this still, Charlie, as a young man, he was 19 years old when he started working for SNCC, and he was noted then as a man of incredible uh, human spirit and ironic temperament, and as you're going to see tonight, besides being insightful and clever and a tremendous speaker, he still manifests the milk of human kindness uh, uh, by, in, in a massive volume. So Charlie, thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. And we look forward to, to hearing you. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, and thanks to all the people, uh, most of whom I do not know, who are responsible for uh, bringing me out here to Adams uh, State uh, University, my first time on this. Uh, campus. Um, I uh, will start with a commercial. Uh, there won't be enough time tonight for me to go into great detail uh, to uh, the movement history that uh, 
So I, I want you to write down or perhaps memorize uh, the website um, onevotesnick.org. That's O N E, votesnick.org, which is the product of a collaboration between the SNCC Legacy Project, on whose board I sit, and Duke University to present uh, in digital form online um, SNCC's work. In this particular site, which was launched uh, uh, last March, uh, focuses on voter registration. And there you can see profiles of people who are critical to the movement who are not known at all. They include SNCC field secretaries, local people in various communities, largely in Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, events uh, that were important to the shape that the movement took over during the 1960s. So I, I recommend you. Uh, particularly if you find yourself interested in anything that I say this evening uh, going to that site. And I should say uh, that we have, since launching that site, we have received a grant to continue uh, this collaboration with Duke University. Uh, we got a Mellon Foundation grant to work with, to collaborate with Duke, again, uh, on a digital gateway to s all of SNCC's work and history. It's a three-year project, uh, and I spent a lot of time on the Duke uh, University campus. And what we're doing in addition to presenting information about the movement, and it's a SNCC site, it's not the whole story, it's not even most of the story, it's SNCC's story. Uh, and, but in addition to presenting information about SNCC and its work, what we also are piloting is the ways and means of collaborate for movement veterans uh, to collaborate with academic institutions to present history. And our notion of history is that it should be, and I'll talk some more about this tonight, that history is better approached from the bottom up than the top down. And this collaboration is, we hope, will pilot and interest the way for other academic institutions to approach veterans of whatever movement as a way of, of uh, uh, getting history, especially to young people, uh, uh, across. That's the end of uh, my commercial. Uh, of course, and I say, I should say, speaking specifically to the young people, the college students in this audience, if you go onto the site and look at it and, and navigate it, we, of course, will be very interested in hearing from you, uh, getting responses from you as to what works and what doesn't work. And because most of us who are on the SNCC side are are just discovering the internet. <laughs> uh, my last gathering with, I was telling somebody earlier today, my last gathering on a college campus with students, they took my cell phone and put me on uh, Twitter and then walked to the microphone and announced that they had put me on Twitter to great applause. I also learned about Instagram there. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is uh, the month of uh, Martin Luther King's birthday, and it's uppermost in many people's minds. Uh, the great symbol, iconic symbol, if you will, of, of the movement. And I'm really not going to talk very much about Martin Luther King uh, this evening. I do want to tell you one King story because I think it's relevant to what I am going to talk about. You know, people forget, I think, given that he's got this enormous monument on the mall and for lots of other reasons, that King was once a young guy. Uh, and the Montgomery bus boycott, which lasted uh, 
for 385 days before the, the city gave in and, and agreed to desegregate the buses was initially only supposed to be for one day. Uh, the boycott that one day was so successful that, that community leaders, mostly ministers, preachers, met in Martin Luther King's church. He was the young, new minister in town. Uh, they met, gathered in Martin Luther King's church, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, to discuss extending the boycott and keeping the boycott on until the city gave in. And the fact is that most of the ministers were afraid of trying to do this. And they were coming up with one excuse after the other about why they need not do this. Uh, maybe we ought to form a committee and go uh, meet with the mayor. Or maybe we ought to do this and anything but keep the boycott on. Then in the midst of this discussion, the real leader of Montgomery stood up, E.D. Nixon. He was a Pullman porter, railroad worker. Uh, had been the head of both the local NACP in Montgomery, Alabama and the state NACP. He stands up and I should say this story comes to me from a, a, a friend of Rosa Parks who was one of the important leaders of the Montgomery boycott, Johnny Carr. Uh, who just passed away a couple of years ago, but she was 95 years old when she's telling me this story. Uh, and according to Ms. Carr, uh, E.D. Nixon stood up and stared out at these ministers uh, and said, you preachers been eating these women's fried chicken long enough. Now it's time to get up off your behind and do something for them. You see, because it's the women who were taking the buses. They were the maids, and they were the cooks, and the housekeepers, and the babysitters, and all, all of this. So it's the women that were bearing the brunt of the kind of hostility that black people felt using the public transportation system. So, and so uh, after he said this, the ministers are squirming now, and a little bit of, and embarrassed, I think. And Martin Luther King stands up, he was 26 years old, and he says, according to Ms. Carr, I am not a coward. Because that's essentially what E.D. Nixon had accused the ministers of being. Uh, and they had, when Martin Luther King said that, it changed the tenor of the meeting, and the result was the formation of the Montgomery Improvement Association, which would lead the boycott and the appointment of Martin Luther King as the leader of the Montgomery Improvement Association. This is Martin Luther King's first step in, 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 into public visibility. And later that night at another meeting, I won't go into, but at, at Ralph Abernathy's church, Whole Street Baptist Church, uh, by voice vote, they, they actually formally decided to continue the boycott until the city gave in. So the lesson of this story, which I think is important to understanding what I'm going to talk about and what the movement was, is that as important as the challenges to segregation and white supremacy were in the dynamic of the movement, just as important, and perhaps more important, were the challenges black people made to one another within the black community. You know, as my friend Lawrence Guyot, who, who, who's passed away, but who was the head of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, once said, you know, you can't challenge institutions without challenging yourself first. And that's one of the great lessons of the Southern movement and one that I think is extremely relevant today in this era of Black Lives Matter and Dream Defenders and The Gathering and Moral Mondays and any number of things. Now, that being said, I'm going to start uh, with the conclusion first and then spend my time uh, with remarks showing why I've come to the conclusion I've come to. 
And my remarks will be focused on the young people here. My conclusion has two parts. When it comes to what black people need, we black people have the brains, the ability, and the resources to do whatever we set our minds on doing. Uh, this is another important lesson buried in the movement. And one way to tell it is listen to the freedom songs we used to sing. There's not a one of them that talks about what can't be done. Every single one of them talks about what we're going to do, or how we're going to do it, or what we need to do. Um, that is the great, almost completely missed lesson of the Southern Freedom Movement. We can do what we set out to do. We need to change this society. We need to change the way things are on, we can do it if we're determined uh, to do it. Uh, and nowhere is this clearer than in Mississippi, in my viewpoint. Uh, uh, the young people, uh, the organizing work in Mississippi in the 1960s, young people played the critical role. And in my view, that work is directly responsible for the presidency of Barack Obama. You know, without the kinds of changes that were wrought in the 1960s, you simply would not have Barack Obama, and I'll get to that. The second part of my conclusion is a question for you young people to face today, and in fact, the same question we had to face. What is it that you want your society to be and are not only willing to fight for, but are willing to die for. This is really an organizing question, as distinct from the issue of protest, because I think you have to make a distinction between protest and organizing. So over the next 30 minutes or so, I want to connect some of the dots that are not usually connected in considering the civil rights story and its lesson particularly as they apply to these times. Uh, and I want to place young people front and center. I still don't think that most of us recognize the importance of their efforts in 20th central, century struggle. And I think it should inspire 21st century struggle. Uh, although it is not the only place to begin, I'm going to begin with, with uh, a grown-up, one of, one of the great women of the 20th century, Ella Josephine Baker. Many of us who were with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee consider ourselves her political children. So uh, it is important that, that you understand her. Miss Baker was a Southern woman. And when she met you, she was interested in who your people were and expected you to tell her something about yourself. I call this the who are your people question. That is, you know, part of Southern culture. Uh, so in that vein, uh, I think my first order of business here should, give, should be to give you a little piece of myself in Mississippi, a little personal piece of myself in uh, Mississippi. And again, it relates to this whole question of challenge. Uh, I was a freshman at Howard University in Washington uh, in 1962 with no plans become a part of Mississippi's civil rights movement, but I had been involved in the student sit-in movement. And after finishing uh, the spring semester, I boarded a Greyhound bus for a journey to Houston, Texas, where I planned to participate in a civil rights workshop for young people organized by the Congress of Racial Equality Corps. They'd invited me and given me money for the bus because of my involvement in the sit-in movement. Uh, uh, 
When the bus got to Mississippi, I decided, uh, when the bus got to Jackson, Mississippi specifically, I decided I should meet the students who were sitting in in Jackson, Mississippi. Why? Because from my perspective, and I think the perspective of most of my generation, uh, Mississippi, where Emmett Till was murdered in 1955, was the worst place in the universe for a black person. So it was hard for me to get my mind around students sitting in there. It was one thing for me to be sitting in in Virginia and Maryland, which were segregated as a Howard University student. In my mind, it was something qualitatively different for students to be sitting in in Mississippi. I thought maybe they, maybe they had some kind of gene that made them a little more courageous than we were. So I wanted to meet them, get a close-up look at them to see who they were and perhaps what they, what they were. So I made my way to their office, but I didn't intend to stay. But when I told them I was on the way to Texas for this workshop, one of these students, Lawrence Guiot, who I just mentioned, who was then a student at Tougaloo College, rose from his seat and gave me a stern look. Now, Guiot's a big guy. Uh, and he spoke to me uh, with, pretty much with complete disdain. And he said, and, and you always remember the words in this kind of situation, he says, civil rights workshop in Texas. What's the point of doing that when you're standing right here in Mississippi? Uh, and his tone was almost bullying as well as demanding, you know. So you're just down here to chatter about civil rights, are you? That's what he seemed to be telling me. That's pretty useless. If you're serious, do something other than mouth some words. Stay with it and work with us. And Giat was getting ready to go up into the Delta to, to, to join SNCC's first project up there in Greenwood. Then uh, another guy who was in the room, Jesse Harris, who had been one of the leaders of the Jackson sit-in movement, chimes in and he says, yeah, Charlie, you're in the war zone here. And I got the message. And I really didn't get, and I didn't get back on the Greyhound bus. And I stayed in, uh, wound up staying in Mississippi for almost five years. So that's an important thing for you to know about the shape of me and in relationship to civil rights. And it became the state in the South I was most deeply involved with. Uh, but in addition to uh, in the, my involvement uh, in this state, uh, it's the Mississippians that I really want to talk to you about because I, I think too often the movement gets defined not by the efforts and energy of the local people in these communities, whether it's Mississippi or Alabama or Louisiana or whatever. It gets defined by these, these people from outside came in and saved the, the people. Uh, uh, and uh, I want to start in doing that with the words of someone you won't know. That's a guy named Sam Block. Sam was the first of us, meaning the first of us who were young, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 years old. I was 19 years old when I wound up in Mississippi. And Sam was the first of us, a native Mississippian, to go into the Delta to organize for voting rights. And this is where the White Citizens Council was born. And the, and the Citizens Council was the white collar Ku Klux Klan drawing members from uh, the business and professional class who terrorized the black community using oppressive economic and political strategies. Sam uh, began working in a town where the White Citizens Council was particularly powerful, Greenwood, the county seat of LaFleur County 
Greenwood and the rest of the county, like most of the other Delta towns. And I should say the Delta of Mississippi is, is the cotton country of Mississippi, the plantation country of Mississippi. It, it's, a, it's an alluvial plain washed over by the Mississippi, the Big Black, the Sunflower Rivers, and it leaves a very rich sediment uh, there. It's called the Delta for reasons that are still not clear to me, because if you say Delta, you would think of where the Mississippi enters into the Gulf of, of Mexico, uh, much further south. And because it was plantation country, the population of the Delta was two-thirds black. And only a handful of those black people in the Mississippi Delta were registered to vote. When Sam arrived in LaFleur County, Greenwood and LaFleur County, there were more than 13,000 voting age blacks in LaFleur County, but only about 200 had succeeded in getting registered. But let's pick up Sam's story, and I'm, I'm going to draw on a field report that Sam sent to SNCC shortly after his arrival uh, in Greenwood. And you have to understand, in these little towns, although Greenwood is officially a city, it had 20,000 people when, when Sam arrived. And, and it does, it's almost immediately known that you're in town. And, and Sam was hunted, and he was hiding out. There were, nobody was brave enough to put him up. And he was sleeping at one point in his car in a, in a junkyard. Uh, anyway, in Sam's report, uh, the N-word, as we now say in polite company, is used. And it's necessary, uh, as you'll see. So, but I do want to apologize in advance for any discomfort it causes. Now here's this excerpt. I want you to listen to from Sam's report. He says, we went up to register and it was the first time visiting the courthouse in Greenwood, Mississippi. And the sheriff came up to me and he asked me, he said, nigger, where are you from? I told him, well, I'm a native Mississippian. He said, yeah, yeah, I know that, but where are you from? I don't know where you from. I said, well, I'm from around some counties here. He said, well, I know that, but I know you ain't from here because I know every nigger and his mammy. I said, you know all the niggers. Do you know any colored people? He got angry. He spat in my face and he walked away. So he came back and turned around and told me, I don't want to see you in town anymore. The best thing you better do is pack your clothes and get out and don't never come back no more. I said, well, Sheriff, if you don't want to see me here, I think the best thing for you to do is pack your clothes and leave. Get out of town, because I'm here to stay. I came here to do a job. And this is my intention. I'm going to do this job. Now this is the 22-year-old Sam Bach. Now I think this exchange, which took place on the steps of the LaFleur County Courthouse, explains everything you need to know about us. Sam's words were a promise and a prediction. We stayed to do the job, were committed to doing the job, and in doing the job, broke the back of apartheid in Mississippi. But the outcome did not just affect Mississippi, but changed America. The job we did resulted in changing forever the rules of the National Democratic Party. And that is what laid the groundwork for the Obama presidency. In fact, laid the groundwork for Hillary Clinton's campaign for the presidency, and I could go, uh, I could give you a whole lecture on what are now known as the McGovern rules that, 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 uh, that resulted as a result of the challenge of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. I will spare you that particular lecture uh, here. But basically, in fighting for the right to vote and winning, 
the door was open to the possibility of winning any elected office, even the highest in the land. As black abolitionist Frederick Douglass pointed out more than 150 years ago, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. I stand here tonight in praise of our struggle and to testify that the violence underlying the Greenwood Sheriff's words reveal the blood-soaked ground in Mississippi and across the American South that has been the price of progress. In Washington, uh, approaching this history, however, uh, I should say, and, and I stand here to insist that this should never be forgotten, that, that there's an, actually a duty and an obligation that we have, all of us, to repay this history. Now, approaching this history, there are, of course, some legitimate questions uh, uh, that you may want answered in trying to grasp why I think uh, Sam's courthouse encounter with the sheriff was so significant. Who was Sam Block? He was only 22 when this happened. That's kind of young, isn't it? How did he get to Greenwood? What made him stay in defiance of the sheriff's threat? The larger question is, how do we get from Sam Block in 1962 to Barack Obama today? This is a question that looms very large when you consider what those times were like. A year before this Greenwood incident, Freedom Riders, black and white interstate bus travelers seeking to sit together on the bus while traveling in the South had been brutalized by violence coordinated by the Ku Klux Klan and the Alabama police. As their firebomb bus burned, U.S. Attorney Robert Kennedy wondered aloud whether the country was headed toward a second civil war. So again, how do we get from then to now? For some answers that particularly answer this basic question, let's look more closely at Sam. Uh, and these answers are largely ignored in the history books and in other narratives of the civil rights movement. First, Sam Block was a native Mississippian specifically from the delta town of Greenville, Cleveland in Bolivar County, which neighbors LaFleur County. Sam represents the fact that Mississippi's civil rights movement was driven and led by Mississippians. And also, importantly, I must add here, the southern movement was led and driven by southerners. You heard just a few minutes ago how the Mississippians more or less kidnapped me. They organized to change their society, organized a way to, to change a way of life that for over 300 years had been defined by white supremacy, absolute white power over black people. Through their organizing, these largely unsung heroines and heroes changed the nation. The 1965 Voting Rights Act, for example, that has so dramatically increased black voting power was almost entirely the result of the Southern freedom struggle. But before going on, let's continue to look at Sam. As I said, he was just 22 years old at the time of his confrontation with the sheriff. Among another thing largely missing from the narrative about the civil rights movement is that in many instances it was led by young people like Sam. I can remember my first reaction to the sit-ins and I was a 12th grader in high school when the students in Greensboro, North Carolina began sitting in and they're coming to me via television. Protests in Nashville, protests in Atlanta, and they're coming to me by television. But what I'm seeing are people more or less my own age for the first time taking action. Because up until I saw the sit-ins, civil rights was something that grown-ups did. I never thought about it in terms of something that somebody my age uh, would uh, do. Within two months, of course, those protests that began in Greensboro spread to 80 uh, southern cities. To quote Martin Luther King, speaking in support of sit-ins at a February 16, 
1960 civil rights rally in Durham, North Carolina, he said, what is new in your fight is the fact that it was initiated, fed, and sustained by students. So uh, for me, uh, looking at young people like Diane Nash and John Lewis of the Nashville movement or Julian, or Julian Bond or Ruby Dora Smith of the Atlanta movement or Charlie Jones of the, of the Charlotte, North Carolina movement, I'm seeing, I'm seeing myself and I'm planning to go to college the next year and um, you know, if you were black in 1960 and planning to go to college, uh, you really, the odds were you'd be going to a historically black college or university, not a school like this, Adams State University, not that they, not a Harvard, not Brown, you were going to be going to a historically black college or university, which meant that you would be going to school in the South which meant that you would be confronted with what you're looking at on the television, what you're watching Don, Diane Nash and John Lewis protest. So the question that's coming through to you as you're watching this on television or reading about it in the newspapers is, well, what are you going to do when you're confronted with this? Will you be like John and Diane or will you just do nothing. Um, uh, as, as Bob Moses put it, describing his reaction when, when he saw in New York City newspapers photographs of students sitting in at southern lunch counters, he says, they looked like I felt. And I think I would say the same thing. But back to Sam. Sam was one of Amzi Moore's people. That's who sent him via SNCC to Greenwood. SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, grew out of the sit-in movement and then evolved into an organization of organizers working closely with older veterans of civil rights struggle. Many of them local NACP leaders like Amzi. You won't the name his name any more than you knew Sam's. But you need to know some things about AMSI because understanding what he represents is another essential component of any real discussion about the civil rights movement in Mississippi and understanding people like AMSI, World War II veterans, local NACP leaders wanting to affect change, the age of our parents and grandparents. Without understanding these people, you can't understand what happened in the South and the movement. Anzi Moore was the president of the Cleveland, Mississippi NAACP and had decided that he wanted to tap into and use the young energy he saw in the sit-in students. He admired what the students were doing, but was not at all interested in organizing sit-ins in his little town. He wanted a voter registration campaign and he put, put that idea on our political plate. It was not an idea we thought of. Amzi, 49 years old, put that idea on our political plate, challenging our idea that direct action only meant sit-ins picket lines of protests and protest march. AMSI wanted to see the emergence of black power in the Delta. The black people were there. The registered black voters were not. And he wanted to use our energy to get those black registered voters. And as we began working in the Delta, AMSI Moore, AMSI Moore's home was our central headquarters. His house was an orientation center, a place for breakfast of scrambled eggs, for spaghetti dinner. It provided telephone connections. It was always full of conversation, as well as Amzi's sometimes grim, sometimes funny stories of Delta life and earlier civil rights struggle. Floodlights washed his backyard because he was certain that one night Ku Klux Klansmen 
or white terrorists of some sort would attack his home. Our relationship with AMSI puts into perspective yet another important dimension of the modern civil rights movement of the 1960s that may be useful for the 21st century. The convergence of young people like Sam or myself with older people like AMSI. As I said, he was 49 years old when we met him. I had just turned 19. They were willing to share their experiences and open up to us networks that they had built over many years, even decades of struggle. So how did AMSI make his way to us? <laughs> Ella Baker introduced us to AMSI. You cannot talk of 20th century civil rights struggle without discussing this remarkable woman. And let me also say as an aside here, although it should really be central to our discussion, that you cannot talk about 20th century civil rights struggle without talking about the leadership of women. And I make a distinction in my mind. I say the leadership of women. I'm not, not the role of women. I say you have to talk about the leadership of women. Miss Baker, and she was always Miss Baker to us. Again, she was 57 years old when we met her. <laughs> Ms. Baker was the NAACP's director of Southern Branches in the 1940s. And she was the person who organized Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, after the 1955-1956 Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott. And she immediately recognized the significance and potential of the emerging student sit-in movement in 1960. And she negotiated $800 from Martin Luther King to bring the students together at her alma mater, Shaw College, now University, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Out of this meeting came SNCC, the organization for which I was a field secretary. Martin King gave the money because he wanted a student wing to his organization. That's what he wanted. Uh, and. Uh, he, we might have become that, except he, he made two speeches at that conference. The first speech was kind of a welcome, I'm proud of you young people kind of speech. Uh, and then the second speech he gave later on was one which he asked the young people gathered to think about becoming a part of his organization. But he said that to do that, you had to commit to nonviolence as a way of life. And most of the students were not willing to do that. Nonviolence, from our point of view, was a tactic that seemed to work. Uh, we were not prepared to embrace it as a way of life, the way he had. Uh, and I think if he hadn't asked that, uh, what we now know of as SNCC, would have been the student arm of SCLC. He made a mistake asking us to, uh, to do that. As, but anyway, as much as anyone, and more than most, Ella Baker's hands and Ella Baker's brains shaped the theory and methods of community organizing, which, in my view, is what really defines the modern civil rights movement. And her main lesson to us her main instruction to us was organize from the bottom up. Strong people don't need strong leaders, she would say. Now, many people date the start of the modern civil rights movement that embraces, embraces the decade of the 1960s with the founding of the uh, NACP in 1909. I start in a different place for me. The modern civil rights era begins shortly before the outbreak of World War II and ends with the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. Of course, there are many other potential starting points, the emergence of the Niagara Movement that preceded the founding of the NACP, the campaigns of Ida B. Wells, the founding of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Union in 1925, A. Philip Randolph's 
threat to lead a march on Washington in 1941 or the 1954 Supreme Court decision declaring unconstitutional racism and segrega racial segregation in public schools, and certainly as many do the 1955-56 Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott. AMSI sort of embraces a lot of that, and he and, and often AMSI, who is one of my more vivid images of AMSI's house and, and that Mississippi I encountered in 1962, often AMSI, who had fought the Nazis overseas after all, sat in the bay window of his living room with his rifles and his pistols waiting the, to repel an attack he was certain would come. And it may be the reason that attack never came. Although a number of historical forces mark the era of modern civil rights struggle, in my opinion, the convergence of some very particular and very critical forces laid the foundation for the modern struggle from which there would be no turning back. The commitment in, to democracy and human rights embedded in World War II's fight against fascism, the accelerating struggles for decolonization in Africa and Asia, post-war economic and educational opportunity in the United States, with, and with so much war of the world in rubble, the emergence of the United States as a, as a superpower. And finally, the 54 Supreme Court decision, which began the process of dismantling the, uh, uh, the legal framework which underwrote U.S. apartheid. Importantly, the decision it engendered hope, one of the indispensable ingredients for resistance. But what uniquely marks the era though, and again extremely relevant to the 21st century, is that people who were usually spoken for others began to speak for themselves. And not only that, spoke for themselves in such a way that they could not be ignored. This is a very important point, so let me restate it in a slightly different way. Ordinary people who were usually spoken for by sympathetic advocates or of by hostile white supremacists began speaking for themselves saying, this is what we demand. This is the kind of society we wish to live in. Montgomery, Alabama's mid-1950s bus boycott uh, and the now almost completely forgotten student struggle in 1951, Farmville, Virginia, may be the post-World War II events that best represents this. I also think the person who probably best symbolizes this in the decade of the 1960s is Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer of Sunflower County, uh, Mississippi. Maybe of all the people we work with, she probably is the best known. And I was with Mrs. Hamer the first time she tried to register to vote. She was a sharecropper and a timekeeper on a Delta plantation who became not only the leader of Mississippi's 1960s movement, but a great national voice for civil rights. Uh, you know, um, that day when we all went down to the courthouse with with Ms. Hamer, and it was scary because the county seat, Indianola, was where the White Citizens Council was organized for the fir first time, and uh, we had to go to the county court. It was a notoriously violent uh, county. We had 17 people, included Mrs. Hamer. The, uh, I was telling people earlier today over dinner how she calmed the people with, with, with her singing on the bus in a way that we couldn't, you know. We knew we were going into danger and in going to that county courthouse. Everybody was afraid and we, the organizers, had nothing to offer the people. We couldn't tell them that we can protect you. We couldn't tell them we can get federal marshals in here to protect you. We had nothing to offer in the way of protection. But from the back of the bus, Mrs. Hamer began singing. And just through the power of her voice, eased the tension and cooled and calmed down the terror on that bus. The same thing happened later in the day. What happened on this, to make a long story short, uh, 
after two or three people went in to try and register to vote at the county courthouse, the circuit clerk shut the office down. And this had all taken a very long time, so now we're getting close to sunset. Not a good time to be on the road in a bus that's identified with civil rights in that particular county. Everybody got back on the bus, but before the bus got out of town, it was stopped by the police. And the driver was placed under arrest for driving a bus of the wrong color. He was driving a school bus that was usually used to carry day workers to cotton fields. And we had rented the bus for that day to bring people to the county courthouse. But he was arrested for driving a bus with the black and stripes and all of that. And again, there was like this fear, well, what are we going to do? The sun is now setting. We can't go anywhere. The driver has been arrested. We're stuck. And then Mrs. Hamer begins to sing again. And this is really the first time we noticed her. And calms the fear down. And we had a rational discussion. And what the people on the bus decided to do was to take up a collection. How much money did people have? Take up a collection and approach the policeman that was holding the driver to see what the fine was. And, and I remember the policeman said the fine was $100. And we had collected $47, I think, from all the people, <laughs> all of us. <laughs> That's how much money we had. And the policeman said it was $100. And, and they, they, the group elected a spokesman. It was not Charlie Cobb or Bob Mose or somebody doing this. These are the people we had brought to try and register to vote. Sharecroppers, maids, and, and, and the like. And we had this $47, so they told the policeman, the spokesperson told the policeman, well, we only have $47. And if that's not acceptable, then what he ought to do is just arrest everybody. It's an amazing thing to occur in a town where the White Citizens Council was born at sunset uh, when you're there in defiance with the customs of white supremacy, white supremacy and black subservience. But that's what they said. They said, well, you should arrest all of us uh, if you don't accept. Well, he took the $47. I have no idea as to whether the $47 actually made it to the coffers of the county government, <laughs> but he did take the $47 and permit the uh, driver uh, to continue bringing us back. And there's a lot more to Mrs. Hamer's story that I won't tell you. You can see some of it on the site I just gave you and a couple of biographies of her. My point is that it was that important understanding what was unfolding not just in Mississippi, is that people were finding their own voice and beginning to speak for themselves. And these were the maids and the sharecroppers, the day workers, the cooks, the janitors, the farmers, the factory workers, students, ordinary people who were usually spoken for or of. These voices began to be heard, or at least could no longer be ignored in the mid-20th century. And through organization and direct action, they changed a way of life. Whatever remains undone, and there's a lot that remains undone, these people changed a way of life that had been in place for a hundred years. Um, there are many stories like this that help us understand how powerfully important community organizing has been to our struggle. Uh, you know, I'm thinking here of, of, a, of an organization emerged in Montgomery, Alabama uh, called Club From Nowhere. Georgia Gilmore, another one of Rosa Parks' friends, uh, who was fired from her job as a cafeteria worker because of her active participation uh, in the boycott, organized this club from nowhere, which was an organization of women who baked and sold cookies, pies, and cakes to raise money for the Montgomery Improvement Association. At its peak, the club was bringing in uh, uh, $200 uh, a week, a considerable sum 
or mid-1950s, uh, uh, Alabama. I want to talk um, very briefly, and I, I want to leave time for questions, uh, uh, about uh, uh, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Because part of what Lawrence Guyot and Sam Block and Amzi and, and all the others I've mentioned in these brief remarks were doing was organizing people for change. And they, they chose as a vehicle uh, to create something called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. The regular Democratic Party was all white and completely uh, discriminatory. Uh, and what the MFDP, the Democratic Party, did was during the 1964 National Democratic Party Convention challenge the legitimacy of the so-called regular Democratic Party from Mississippi. He said, well, they exclude blacks. In fact, it's interesting, uh, Mississippi, the Democratic Party had, in Mississippi had pretty progressive rules. They call for almost complete transparency. If you were electing, a, creating a delegation to participate in the party's convention, you started at the precinct level, you advertised in newspapers that there would be precinct meetings, and then you had county meetings, regional meetings, and then a state meeting, all of which led to the creation. The problem was they ignored these rules entirely. They, they met in... They rarely announced where they were meeting. I remember Amzie Moore, I'm not Amzie Moore, Aaron Henry brought uh, 20 people. He, Amzie, Aaron Henry was the state president of the NACP, a leader in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And he brought 20 people to the precinct meeting in uh, Clarksdale, Mississippi. And they were led in, and it turned out there were only five other people in the meeting, five white men in the meeting. So his group outnumbered uh, uh, the whites there. Well, what the chair of the meeting did was adjourn the meeting and then he went around town till he got enough whites to outnumber the blacks that uh, Aaron Henry had brought. And then resumed the meeting and elected, you know, uh, an all-white all -white group to go on to the next stage of the meeting, which would be a county meeting. Aaron Henry was a pharmacist and Aaron, or Doc as we call him, told us that the next day after that meeting, there was a knock on the door of his pharmacy, and it was a white guy. And the white guy said he had stopped by to thank Aaron Henry for bringing his delegation to the meeting, because he said, we never hear about these meetings. We've never been involved in these meetings. And the only reason we became involved in this meeting was because you brought your people to that meeting. So that's how they operated uh, in, uh, in Mississippi. So the challenge, the challenge was not successful. Not because nobody disagreed really with the proposition that there was blatant racist oppression in Mississippi, but politics kicked in. The Dixiecrats or Southern Democrats were extremely powerful in the Democratic Party and Lyndon Johnson and, and uh, National Party leaders were not going to buck the uh, Southern Dixiecrats as they were called. So, so the Mississippi Freedom Democrat, and that led to a lot of bitterness, and that's a whole nother lecture that I'm not going to give you now, but it, it would lead to black power and the Lowndes County Freedom Organization and, and the like. But it also led to, it forced the discussion inside the Democratic Party about the participation of women and minorities, which resulted in 1972 in the McGovern rules, in which, in writing, the Democratic Party explicitly goes on record and commits itself to never permitting, you know, racist delegations to uh, participate in, there had to be diversity. In fact, as I recall the rules, 50% of the delegates had to be women according to the McGovern rules. And there had to be a substantial representation of minorities, blacks, Latinos, and, and so forth. That's all comes out 
of this challenge by the Mississippi Freedom Democratic, which is part of why I say Barack Obama has uh, election has to be at, at least in part uh, credited. Now I want to say one more thing before uh, opening up for questions. Although I've been talking about civil rights struggle in Mississippi and in the South, really this era is about more than civil rights. It's also about civil liberties. And that's important since we're living uh, in an era in which civil liberties are being eroded uh, in the name of national security. We had to fight for the right to protest. <laughs> we had to fight for the right to associate with people we wanted to associate with. And that ranged from gays. I mean, Martin Luther King was attacked in because of his association with Bayard Rustin, who was brilliant and gay. It was By Bayard Rustin was the one who opened up, who organized the 1963 March on Washington. We had, to, there were only three black lawyers in the entire state of Mississippi in the early 1960s, just three. Uh, we use them, but we also chose to use lawyers from the National Lawyers Guild, a left-wing organization. And we were attacked because we were using left-wing lawyers. And, and our argument was, these are people like Bill Consular and Arthur Canoy and, and whatnot. Uh, we were attacked, you know, and we're saying we got three lawyers in the whole state. <laughs> What do we care about there? We care not any, the only question of importance to us is will they defend us in court? So we had to fight these civil liberties issues, the Red Scare, all of this is, is going on and we were attacked by state authorities for being communist. And it, is, it's, it gives you some interesting insights. Uh, I, there's a story, I think it's an apocryphal story because it, it changes depending on who's telling the story. But roughly the story is some woman, there's been a, a, a denunciation of some civil rights activity as communist sponsored or communist backed. And then some lady in some rural area hearing these accusations of communism comes up to a civil rights worker, a SNCC worker, a core worker, and says something like, I'm sure glad you communists came here. <laughs> and <laughs> she's, she's seeing us as people who are just willing to fight for rights. And if, if the whites want to label us communists, she's fine uh, with that. Um, but this question of civil liberties, I think, looms as large today as the unfinished business of civil rights struggle. The great unfinished business of civil rights is education. You know, there's been almost, yes, uh, there's been almost no improvement. In fact, you can make the case there's been a decline in public education. And that's a civil, you cannot be a full citizen if you're coming out of high school reading and writing and calculating at an eighth grade level. You cannot be, a, you, you can't function in any meaningful way. You cannot put a roof over your head or your family's head. You cannot put food on your table or your family's table. So that's the great unfinished business of civil rights. But the civil liberties question is uh, paramount today. Uh, it, just, it doesn't take much 
listening of Donald Trump and the like to realize this. So finally, con consider this, which can serve as a theme for today's struggle as much as it served as the founding principles of the United States in 1787. Uh, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States. For all the contradictions found throughout U.S. history, this is the core ideal of the country. But do we really want to do this? <laughs> Government, as we've known it since the country's inception, has always been ambivalent and at many times hostile to this ideal. Slavery stands as the clearest example. The Mozambicans said over the years of their fight in East Africa to free themselves from Portuguese rule, a luta continua, the struggle continues. And this idea is really the heart of my message to you this evening. What we learn in the passage of time from Martin Luther King's emergence to the now of Barack Obama. It's the emergence of ordinary people as leaders and spokespeople who are the real force for change. People who keep their eyes on the prize as the old song goes. And today this need is more urgent than it has ever been, and perhaps, too, more possible. Thank you. Thank you.